Hi, I'm Sarah Betcher. I'm an Alaskan ethnographic filmmaker and owner of Farthest North Films. For the last couple years, I've been working as the filmmaker for Sustainable Futures North, based primarily at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, a project that explores interactions among food, water, energy security, and community sustainability. I directed, filmed, and edited Tied to the Land, Voices from Northwest Alaska. This six-part film series showcases how 10 Northwest Alaskan villages are seeking ways of adapting to rapid changes in climate, weather, and development. You will be immersed into the daily lives of active hunters, fishers, and gatherers by air, land, and sea. And I hope you enjoy watching Tied to the Land film series. The subject of offshore drilling has been around for a number of years. Is there a way that we can have our coastal communities of Alaska benefit from this? Is there cheaper energy to be had? In our communities, every single one of them heats with stove oil, electricity from diesel. We have some of the highest costs of living if we take a journey to Ambler, Shungnak, and Kobuk, for instance, for heating a home, those folks are paying somewhere between $10.50 and $11 a gallon for heating fuel. And the same price for a gallon of gasoline for their snow machines or upboard motors. I see a lot less snow machine tracks out, out in the country just due to lack of fuel and having the money to buy it. I mean, it's so expensive. Here in Ambler, we're paying uh, 1075 a gallon. And they've got so many villages that run out of gas at the same time. A lot of times we run out when we have no warnings for two weeks to a month because the airlines are so busy. And we have to drive to Shungnak or I've gone to Selwick and I've gone to Kayana just to get gas. and. It takes a lot of gas just to get there. Today, for gas and heating fuel, it's $10 a gallon. When we had a lower price for fuel, I was able to travel as far as I wanted to go and stayed as long as I could because I had a larger supply of fuel in the boat. Now, before I leave, I know how long I'm going to stay, regardless if I get caribou or not because fuel supply is so limited. Freight companies will bring in between 3,000 and 5,000 gallons, depending on the temperature of the air. Some days, six, seven loads of fuel, and that'll get us by for a couple of months, and then they'll come back again in the winter. At the fuel project, the IRA Council, the tribe is the owner. We're the only fuel here in the village to get our fuel. Between April and May, we start filing for loan. We start getting our shipments early as June, maybe last shipment in September. And then we have stove oil to heat your homes. Right now, one gallon without the tax is $7.50 for stove oil. One gallon for the motor gas is $7.75 without the tax. Because of the high rate of unemployment here in this village, people that can't afford to get fuel, the elders and the disabled, they file for heating assistance program. Families eligible get help with their heating, and heating assistance program provides some of the cost to pay for your electricity. My uh, electricity about almost last month I pay. $190 and a lot of people get disconnected because they have no job right now. I'm about ready to get disconnected too. <laughs> Our stores, some of them are operated by the IRA, the tribes. Some of them are operated by ANICA and some of them are done privately. 
So there's kind of a smorgasbord of ways to get goods and services in each community. During the summer months, we lose money because when we order freeze, they all come in bypass. Since they come in bypass, we have no say of when they're going to bring freeze ice cream. During the winter months, our produce and our chill, they travel from Anchorage to Kotzebue, and some will be froze by the time they get here because of the cold. Unless they keep them inside the warm storage in Kotzebue, we'll get good product. If not, because of the bypass, we do tend to get a lot of freeze fruit. Three days is the fastest time I know that we had received our freight. The AC is divided into three categories. You got village stores, hub stores, and water stores from the southeast all the way to Barrow. Kotzebue is a hub store, Bethel, Barrow, big places like that. Basically defined by that it serves a surrounding community of villages. Being here in the Arctic, here in Kotzebue, with no roads, there's two big obstacles. The first is the distance and the no roads. So everything comes by plane, except the barge or two in the summer, which adds to cost. And then the air freight system is affected by weather all the time, especially in the winter. Some of the air carriers can't de-ice their wings. They're not new enough to have that. So if the temperature drops enough, it's not safe to fly their planes here because they'll ice up. And then the fog in the spring is a big deal for us. You can almost always count on Alaska Airlines morning flight is going to get delayed or canceled. Compounded by the fact that freight here for the grocery store comes mostly as bypass mail, so it has a lower priority. So anything that's priority freight gets flown by the airlines before our food. When the planes don't fly, we out here in the villages, you know, we, we suffer. No mail delivery, no foods delivered, not only to Norvig, but other villages in the region. And everything is in Kotzebue, everything flies out of Kotzebue. Last winter, Kotzebue got snowed in and no planes flew out of Kotz for 10, 12 days. The shelves were virtually empty. The freezers were empty. Folks that had spent the summer, you know, hunting and fishing, getting ready for the winter, were folks that were called on by the community to help out folks that didn't have the means to do subsistence hunting. It was a community effort to keep folks, you know, alive around here because planes could not fly out of cots because of weather issues. It could be really nice here in Norvig, but we get a call from Kotzebue that the planes aren't flying because of fog, heavy, heavy fog. And that happens quite frequently. And here in Norvig, there's very rarely a day where planes cannot land and fly out of Norvig. So that spread a lot of chatter as far as making Norvig a hub for this region. I would say rather than a limitation on what you can get, it's a limitation on how much you can get and how long you can hold it for. We have a really small freezer space and small cooler space and even just small back room for dry goods in general. So a lot of availability here is impacted by the fact that we can't keep a lot of extra on hand. So if there is a weather event or something that delays it, we're more prone to run out than a store that might have more space to keep that stuff stored, especially on perishable items or chill or frozen stuff. I've been very aggressive to try and find solutions and partner up with folks that can provide solutions for some of these issues that we're facing here in our community. One of the things that came up was building a, a really nice warehouse here in Norvik. That one would be able to receive a lot more goods, to have the capacity to bring in vegetables and fruits, meat by the bulk, store those in coolers and freezers. It would be a lot cheaper, not only for Norvik residents, but for our villages, uh, like Hyena, Selwick, Ambler, Shungnak. I don't think the villages feel food secure. The transportation issues, you know, you can only get in so much food at one time. If you're relying on an outside source, sometimes different things can happen that d delay those, those goods. And not everybody is able to go out hunting or berry picking or fishing. Some families can't rely on those resources either. We offer nutritious foods for pregnant women, breastfeeding, postpartum infants, children under five. In our region, we have about 7,200 people. And of those, we have about 870 clients on WIC.
Alaska is unique because of how remote everything is. We're actually the only state that offers the food boxes, which they get all their food mailed from a warehouse out of Anchorage. And we have quite a few people who choose to do it for their baby because if they're on infant formula, sometimes the stores run out of formula quickly. So they choose to do the food box because it's a little bit more reliable than relying on the store to get their formula. It's just the nature of where we live. You know, when planes can't come in for a few days, when there's a storm, the shelves of the store are bare. Because of that, they're a little, a little bit more limited on what they're able to get and, and what will sell. Nobody wants to buy wilted lettuce. Things like that don't ship as easily as apples and oranges. As far as if the stores run out of this and run out of that, we've never depended on a store to go from day to day. We've always had stuff in our freezer. And Air freight has just gone up in the past several years. It's just driven up all the prices in all the stores. 16-ounce jar mayonnaise, I mean, it costs like 14 to $16. Neither I buy all groceries and not gas. You know, it's a balancing act out here that everybody got to deal with nowadays. When I was growing up, we would get regular barge service for a lot of our fuel, freight, and goods. Now the river bed has shallowed, so there's no freight company that'll come up the river anymore. Now we're back to flying everything in, and the freight charge is coming into town to transport gear. It gets cost prohibitive. There are occasions where we buy meat from the store, but not very often. We don't have no store-bought foods in the freezer. Not very much. Because you had to be a rich man to buy uh, steaks and stuff like that. 